you have any questions you can ask them now yes papa ji jide sade sanchit karmya jide tirkuti jam bram vich jama rende hai jado sant sat ko this is important question he has raised in punjabi so i'll translate into english for the rest of the people he was first asking about the life force the soul and the shabad the sound and the face of the master we see the radiant form where do they exist i said all three exist at the same place second question was the distinction between the face of the master the radiant form and the shabad roop the sound form and i told him that when we go higher above ram both of them merge and become the same thing the sound and the face become the same thing and no distinction is left at that time but the question is now asking is that what about people coming for the first time where did the karma come from now that's the question i wanted to share with everybody that when we had no karma in our true home in such kind he coming to this world for the first time a world created by karma how did this karma come when we had no karma at all what kind of karma was there now that is actually when the individuated soul descends below parbrahm into the world of the three worlds in the causal stage prakuti the top of the three worlds at that stage there are what are called there is an akash a sky containing all possible permutation combination of destinies karma they contain the blueprints of every type of life that be that can be created in any life form most particularly it has a large selection of human life forms which you can take it shows what your life from the beginning to the end will be and to have that life what past lives will exist with the, with this to create that life it will also show what that life form will create in the future life now so the packages are such if you want to pick up one lifetime of a human being here it has to carry with it past lives to create that human life because no life can be created without past karma so the package is there we are we have karma free you come here and get a choice you can pick up any one of these combination that you like the time machines offers us this option go oh, look around this library of videos and the dvds sitting there pick up which one and you play it out that will be your life we go and pick up our tape pick up our dvd and say this one looks good reasonable and this looks very really good we don't go too far to see how long we'll be there because of that it looks like a good life now so we pick up that and come and get trapped here and all the other life times that are part of that package comes into play or we can be one of the marked souls and say i can pick up an experience through the dvd but i want to make sure that i escape so i look into this life as this and i want to find a life where i find a perfect living master and go back doesn't matter if it has some ups and downs but i like to make sure of that we pick that package we come at the right time the master appears and we go back home that's a great choice perhaps the only choice that is soul individuated consciousness makes when descending into these three worlds so therefore when you pick up that you play it the play is called life we are all playing that dvd and it looks like real life because while playing it in the dvd we have not only placed ourselves as a audience of the dvd we have placed ourselves as a character also acting in the dvd so we are acting in that we have a role in that and we become a witness to the play as well as the actor at the same time which is exactly what we are doing now we are looking at the play around us and we are also acting in this play and we do not realize that the entire play is pre recorded we do not realize all the free will choices we will make are pre recorded we do not realize the whole law of karma that will operate is pre recorded that when it says you will choose this and they have this we chose it at that time we made a choice of all choices at one go when we got in here so 
the karma that we get here is picked up from a predetermined package of karma. We didn't have any karma. Now, second point, which is more important, we never have karma even when we, we are here. The karma is held by another part of an equipment called the mind. The mind plays that karma and we are powering the mind to become alive because we are consciousness. Without consciousness, the mind cannot function. Body cannot function. Senses cannot function. We provide the power to work there. We are the powerhouse for playing the DVD. So when the DVD plays, we are providing the power and we go through the whole experience as if it is happening to us. When we go back, we find the truth of all this. That this is what we chose. We wanted to have an adventure. We picked up our own, uh, own life frames, past, present and future. Now the beauty is, when you pick up one lifetime, you pick up infinite past lifetimes. Not five or six. Because you require infinite. Every lifetime requires a previous lifetime. So, the time, the nature of time that is available for this play is such, it will always be infinite past and infinite future. And these things can go on forever till we step out. When we step out, it ends. It is just like a dream. When we go into a dream, it looks like the things we are seeing have been there forever. We see old buildings in a dream which don't even exist outside. And we say, how old are they? Thousand years old. This is four thousand years old. You wake up and see there was no building seven minutes ago, and now it's a four thousand year old building has come into being. So time and past present are created like that, and it's a, that is the method by which we get. But then don't forget that karma is not real. Soul never has karma. Soul is just experiencing karma. It's experiencing in the company of the mind. And the company of sense perception, which is the next level, company of this physical body, which is next level to that. And in the dream state, which is still next level. So these are different levels of experiences in which we have this uh, karmic experiences. When we go back, nothing was ever experienced. I add for those who are very interested in knowing the truth, the absolute truth, the absolute truth is that this whole show of picking up DVDs, coming into this world, is all taking place in our true home, Sachkant. We never left. We just picked up these experiences and caused a descent of experience to take place. And when we go back, we find we are back home. We never left. It was a very bad dream we had, or a good dream we had. So that's the real truth. So it's, it's not a journey, as we call it. We call it a spiritual journey. Because having lived in time and space, to go anywhere, we think it has to be a journey. So we call the spiritual journey to our own self as a journey. When you wake up, we find it was not a journey. It was a successive awakening. That we awaken ourselves again and again to our own true reality. Yes. Can you tell me what he... Are you commissioned by God uh, to to initiate and bring us back to the highest heavens to God. Oh yes. The perfect living masters who come here are commissioned to do their job. That's their role. Their role is to bring our souls back home. They are, they are human beings commissioned to do that. And therefore, they don't do anything outside the will of God. Yes. I just had a question about when the soul incarnates through so many lifetimes and you see all these individuations of self, these very unique uh, forms, after we leave this world and we're, you know, we're on our not journey, what, what happens to those different parts of ourselves or any self or the self? That was here. Does it does it persist? Is it a part of the greater? I mean, what? How does that interface? The different parts of our self are not really part of the self. They are covers upon the self. For example, this body of ours is a cover it left behind. When we move to the next step, the sense perceptions we have is another cover 
when we go higher, that's left behind. It's discarded. It disappears. When we go to the mind and go above it, the mind disappears. We all put, put on these costumes. These are costumes we wear to have these experiences. And once we go above, these all disappear. The self does not leave any part of it anywhere. The self remains intact, in, integrated, and it remains the same. So the self does not break into any parts. The self experiences parts. For example, the self experiences that there are so many people here. It goes up there and finds all those people who are a creation of a single self. Just like you go to have a dream, in the dream you see a thousand people. When you wake up, a thousand people disappear. Because they were only created for the dream. In the same way, all things other than the self have been created only for the experience of the self. Self remains one all the time. Right up to the top. You say that, that the karma, in fact, is not real in, in the higher level. You realize that it was just part of this game. So if it's not real, then why can't we just say, realize that it's not real, not have to live it? Is there, you know, the perfect master comes to give us a more direct shortcut by eliminating the big cloud that we can't seem to handle. Uh, but if the, the reality is that it really isn't real, is there some things we're not supposed to know while we are here? When we go to see a movie, the movie is not real. They're not real people. Do we leave the hall because it is unreal? We stay for the movie. We don't leave it. The same thing. So is it we, we don't look a shortcut because it is not real. The thing is that when we look at a show, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher. He said, why do we go to see a play? We don't go to see a play because it's unreal. We want to go and see a play because we make it real. We make it so real that we cry and laugh at the play. They are all actors and we take them as real. He says, what he calls is, a willing suspension of disbelief. That we willingly suspend our disbelief in order to enjoy the show. If we did not suppress our disbelief, we would never enjoy the show. So when we come here, we don't, we make it a reality. We want it to be real. Even though it's not real, we want to make it real. So to make it real, like we make a movie a real, we've made this life so real. We take a new chances that we should think it is not real. So we have defined our reality as that which we can check with perception right here. So we check, oh, this is solid. This is real. This is happening like this because there is nothing else we can compare with to say it is not real. So whether it's real or not, we can only find out if we find something other that is real. Since we don't do anything else that is real, we are blocked from that. This becomes real. So we have used the power of illusion in such a great way to not create another illusion but to create reality. Now if you want to know what is really real, supposing you want to know is there something really real, shall I give you an honest answer? Nothing is really real. Everything is created here and there. The only reality is the power of consciousness to create reality. And that is the reality, even such has has been created by the power of consciousness, which is permanent. Not real in the really real sense, because it's the function of consciousness that creates all experiences at all levels. Therefore, it's a comparative re re reality. Relative reality. When you wake up from a dream, this is more real than the dream. So we take it as real. When you go to the next stage, that's more real than this. This becomes unreal, that becomes real. You move higher, that becomes real, the lower one becomes unreal. At one time, we are experiencing one level of consciousness which we consider real. That's our definition of reality. That's how we are experiencing reality. So, no shortcuts. If we wanted shortcuts, we wouldn't make it in the first place. If we didn't want to have this experience, why would he come down anyway? So, we set it up ourselves for adventure. It was our choice. The only thing is, enjoy the adventure. Don't get messed up with it. Don't get tied up here. <laughs> don't, don't say, I'm going to be here forever. Say, I'm ready. After the adventure is over, go back home. 
Yeah. Just one more quick thing. Yes. Of this thing, the one thing that might be real that I hear over and over is unconditional love. Is is that what's real? The unconditional love? Yes. That's that again, that again is a comparison. Unconditional love is real. I'll tell you why. Because unconditional love is the nature of consciousness. Like the other nature, nature of consciousness, the original consciousness from which everything became conscious. Love is part of that. Therefore, love continues to be real at every level, right up to here. But what we call attachments and that become unreal, true love remains real even here. So there's some reality coming right down. What is the reality which we know is real out here? The real thing right here is that there is someone watching the unreality. That's real. The witness to all this show is real. Consciousness is real. All else is made up. Love is real. All else is made up. Masaji, I have two questions. The first one is about creating karma with our thought process. We are aware that sometimes we think about, we have so many negative thoughts. Negative or positive, it doesn't matter. That we don't agree. That we know that it's not our thoughts. So, is the negative power something to do with that? With some thoughts that we don't agree, like uh, we are even uh, f afraid that we thought those thoughts, or is just our karma process? How is that related? The thoughts come from the mind. The mind is a thinking machine. The mind thinks all the time. The mind thinks when we are sleeping. The mind thinks when we are awake. The mind thinks all the time. If the mind stops thinking, we will die. Therefore, the mind, thinking for the mind is like the heartbeat for the body. The heart beats, we are alive. The heart stops, we go. So, similarly, the mind's think, uh, heartbeat is the thinking. It has to keep on thinking. It thinks randomly. It thinks on all the stored information we have. It thinks on all the memories of several lifetimes we have. Picked up, picking up all the elements from those, it keeps on thinking all the time. Therefore, strange thoughts come to us, which we don't know where they're coming from. They're coming from an area which we've forgotten. They're just being picked up randomly by the mind, and those thoughts are coming. If we keep on listening to those thoughts and are concerned with those thoughts, we get into trouble. Because those negative thoughts then affect our actions, they affect our behavior. They affect our feelings, they affect our suffering and pleasure. These negative thoughts affect us to that extent. Therefore, what is the answer to that problem? The answer is, don't let the mind think randomly. You direct it what to think. Mind is a machine in your hands. You as the soul are the owner of this machine. You can direct the mind. When we do meditation, we do Simran. What, is, what, is, what are we doing? We are directing the mind, repeat these words. Like that, we can direct the mind to think on any line we like. We can direct the mind to think of any subject we like. We can direct the mind to think of master. We can direct the mind. Now think of this thing, what we are planning for the master. Think. You can direct the mind and make it occupied with your direction. You will find the master. The mind is a beautiful servant also. It works so well for you. But when we let the mind do, go randomly, and thinking, then those negative thoughts come into the mind from the past and affect us. So, the answer is control your mind by directing it what to do. It's our slave. Remember, the mind is supposed to be a slave. Somehow, we made some mistake somewhere and we have become slaves of the master, of the mind. Now, we have to make the mind back our slave by giving it directions what to do. Yeah. And I have one more and last question. I have seen patients, you talked about emotional karma. So I have seen patients that were very depressed clinically. They did psychotherapy for months and they started on antidepressants and then emotionally they got positive. How this is related to karma? Was that pre-recorded to the process that they would go after with psychotherapy and by changing this thought process, then their emotions also got positive from negative emotions that they had before. The emotional karma comes from the emotional acts that we had in the past. 
when emotions come we take decisions based on those emotions you you are emotionally inclined to do something and you say i should do this because your emotions are guiding you when you do that that creates an emotional karma that's paid off in an emotional way and you have a suffering emotion can be good and bad you can have a bad emotional reaction to that or you can have a very good emotion when people feel loved and they feel they're loving somebody tears come into their eyes they're full of emotion it comes from their heart center it's also a good karma so emotional karma or like all other karmas can be good or bad but the emotional karma is created by an emotional decision we took earlier yes <laughs> what i really do enjoy is the idea of circumstance creates invitation um invitation and the signs around us confirm it so like you were saying uh to follow the will of the master will help you to create or not to create but to decide which path to take and ever since i was even a little kid i would always i i like to play a game with myself when i was a little kid and that was uh, oh the this went that way so i guess i should i'm going to have pasta tonight or i'll eat this or do that and it was a game when i was a kid but today as an adult i begin to wonder am i overthinking sometimes now i still like to think of it as a game because it's inviting it's fun it's like a form of gambling but safe because i keep my money <laughs> but uh when but what i'd like to know is is there an opportunity to perhaps consider training wheels on this uh a way to offer an opportunity to see signs in a designated spot so that i can be come accustomed to noticing those signs as i grow and wondering is there is, can there be an allowance made to seeing these signs so that i can learn more or is there another tool or suggestion you have that allows me to be more focused on oh that's that's a sign there that's something i should listen to very, rather than assuming that is very good then you say overthinking am i overthinking what does overthinking means you always think so we don't think overthink or underthink thinking is a very steady thing that happens in the mind what we really mean then we say overthink is paying too much attention to what we are thinking that looks like overthinking thoughts come in our head all the time how much attention we pay to the thoughts is what creates the feeling of we are thinking too much or thinking too little thoughts are all the time there actually when you are meditating and you are repeating words thoughts are still going on what happens is we don't stop the thoughts we don't stop thinking we only ignore the thoughts we don't pay attention to them and therefore we think now we are away from thoughts actually thinking takes place all the time if we don't pay attention to it it looks like we are not thinking that much there was a student in harvard university when i was studying there and he one day found out that he had learned the art of stopping thinking how to stop thinking so he he called me he says i have found a new kind of a yogic position in which i when i sit and concentrate i stop my thinking i said do you still remain alive he said yes that's why i'm talking to you i said can you come to my house and determine and demonstrate it i used to call some of these people who made these claims to demonstrate in front of me how to stop thinking i also like to learn but i have never been able to stop thinking i don't know anybody who has ever stopped thinking so i called him and i said let us see what is your procedure how to stop thinking he said i take a certain asana and put my hands on my head like this and then i hold it there and i direct my mind stop and stop thinking i said let's experiment now how long can you stop thinking he said maybe for about half an hour i can do easily i said how about a 60 second experiment if you can stop for 60 seconds i'll believe you can stop for half an hour 
Let's try 60 seconds. I have my watch with me. Let's start like this. You take on your position, Asana, and I will give a clap like this. This means there's a time to stop thinking. And watch. 60 seconds later, I'll give you a second clap. You can start thinking again. And then we will sit and examine what happens to human consciousness. What happens to awareness when a person is not thinking? It will be great research and it will be totally new knowledge for me. Let's try it. So he got into his asana and he put his hands in the right position to control his brain and to control his thinking. And then when I saw he was ready and my second hand had come to the top, I gave a clap. And I ignored him because I was looking at the watch to make sure I gave him a second signal after 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, I gave him another clap and he opened his eyes. He's back with us again. I said, now, did you stop thinking for 60 seconds? He said, yes. I have a few questions to ask you now. When I gave the first clap, how did you know that this is the time to stop thinking? I said, don't make up an answer. Remember what happened. We are checking out what actually happens to consciousness, to awareness, when you stop thinking. So he said, I remember. When you gave the clap, I said to myself, this is the time to stop thinking. I said, that's a thought. It included into those 60 seconds. Oh, yes, yes, but that was only a few seconds. I only took two, three seconds to think like that. Cut that out. I said, okay. Now the experiment is only for 57 seconds. <laughs> now tell me, how did you know after that, that when I give the second clock, uh, clap, you will start thinking? Don't make it up. Think. Remember. It's a memory. It just happened. He thought deeply. Oh, yes, I remember. After I said, now is the time to stop thinking, I also said that when he gives me the second clap, I can think again. So that's another thought. I said, after that, how were you sure I will give the second clap while you were waiting for the second clap? Oh, I remember. I did think that second clap will come, I can restart thinking. In about five minutes of discussion, he said, Oh my God, I was thinking more in these 60 seconds than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he thought he had stopped thinking. How could that happen? How could a person feel that he is not thinking when he is thinking all these things? He had no answer. I had the answer for him. I said, the mind does not function in one channel. The mind functions in multiple channels. You can stop one channel, the mind can go into the next channel, keep on thinking in another voice, another subtle voice, and you think you have stopped thinking. That's what happens when we do meditation. We do Simran, we repeat the words, and we think we are repeating the words, and if you are careful, you can see the mind commenting upon those words right there. It's also thinking. And if you make the second one also, level, repeat words, a third level opens up. A fourth level opens up. Carefully examine what happens in the head when you are meditating. You will see the mind never stops thinking. His holiness Dalai Lama came to India. And he was a great meditator. He was a young man. I received him in India. That was part of my government duty. To receive him, house him. And became friends. I had a Land Rover given to me by the government for my job. It's normally a chauffeur drove. But when I had the Dalai Lama with me, I drove it because we both went out. He was learning English very quickly, so we were able to communicate. We discussed meditation. We discussed the concentration of attention. We discussed thinking. He recognized that the mind can keep on thinking at different levels. He's the only person who has ever told me he could actually identify eight levels of thinking in his head at the same time going on. Mind is not that simple. It doesn't think in one channel. Therefore, this guy who thought he stopped thinking had stopped thinking in one level. The other one was keeping on telling him when he can start thinking all the time. And he re realized it when I brought him back to recall. When I told him to recall, he was able to recall it. If the mind thinks all the time, and we say, still your mind. 
we say stop thinking and do your meditation, do your repetition. First of all, repetition is what done by the mind. If it is done with the tongue, it has no value. It has to be done with the mind. It doesn't work otherwise. It starts with the tongue. Your tongue is repeating words. But the mind picks up. Gradually, the tongue doesn't have to work at all. And the mind picks up. It's another practice. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to practice it. But once you practice, the mind keeps on thinking of other things. You do not stop the mind from thinking. You ignore the mind. You ignore the other thoughts and concentrate on one thought. And that is where the power of listening comes in. The power of listening can divert the attention to what you are listening and ignore what you are not listening. And that is why when we say listening is the real secret, not the speaking, not the simran, but the listening to the simran is the secret. The reason is that when you listen attentively to the simran, you do not listen to the rest of the jabbering of the mind. That's still going on. So therefore, that's a very subtle point that the mind does not think in one channel. And therefore, when you feel that the mind has stopped thinking or is uh, doing something else, it's just moved to another channel. In meditation, keep in mind, you cannot stop the mind from thinking. If you stop, you'll die. If the mind stops thinking, mind will die, astral body will die, physical body will die. Disappear at once. It can't stop thinking. It will think. But you can ignore the thinking, that's the meditation process. Meditation is in the human body that we should be able to see the higher regions of consciousness without disturbing the body, keeping it still intact. Dying while living means living in the physical body while having those experiences. So therefore, the intention is not to stop the body from functioning. The body will function, all the vital function will be there and we are still able to go to higher levels because we are ignoring that part of the mind which we don't want to put our attention on. We move our attention up and we don't move the rest of the structure. There was a lady doctor. Her name was Dr. Shakuntala. She lived in Kapurthala, same town where Dr. Isha Singh lived. And she was, she liked great master. She liked his beard. She liked his royal face. She liked how he walked. She liked him as a man. And she respected him, but didn't believe him. She didn't believe in the path of the masters at all. She was a professional medical doctor and said, there is no soul. There is no such thing. All these are made up. These are power of suggestion that we create all these things. And so she didn't bother about these, but she still would come to the Dera to meet him and greet him. And say, I like you. If you have need any medical help, I can give you. If anybody else needs medical help, I will give you. But I can't believe this stuff that you talk about. I don't like your satsangs. I can only meet you after satsang. One day, there was a BB. Out of three BBs who attended of the great master. One was the one who went and lived outside and was doing work. Making chapatis in the langar. Her name was BB Rakhi. And she was a very advanced soul. Every day, meditation experiences, she would go very high. One day, she was sitting in meditation in a little hut and began to scream. Loud screaming, like she's in great pain. And we were her neighbors. In the day, our house was just next to us. We all ran out, other neighbors ran out to see what has happened to the baby. And we tried to stop her from screaming, tried to console she kept on screaming without opening her eyes. Something has gone seriously wrong. So we ran to the great master whose house was next door. He came out. He came out and he saw the BB and he said, call Dr. Shikuntala to look at this BB. This is the time. Send a car and bring that doctor here. So the car was sent and the skeptic, non-believing Dr. Shikuntala came up and great master says, doctor, Look at this BB. She is in hell. And try to see if she can come out of the hell. Master, she is in a very deep trouble. How can you talk that she is in hell? She is in hell because of her trouble. Physical trouble. And everybody tried to open. He said, you try to make her get up from the screaming. Doctor tried and failed. And great master said, BB, come out. And she stopped screaming. 
and she came out and put her heads on the feet of me. I said, what happened to you? She said, I went to hell and I saw actual live hell in the astral plane. Why did you go there? Out of curiosity. Just wanted to see. But did they hurt you? No. And why were you screaming? I was screaming at what I was seeing other people being treated like. So much torture going on there. I couldn't help. This actual incident made that doctor think there may be something in this in this teaching. Anyway, she went back. A few days later, the BB, same BB, was walking and her foot happened to put on a good, I don't know, good, what do you call good? Jaggery, the round ball of jaggery they use for eating for, for sugar. It's raw sugar. And the piece of raw sugar was there and she somehow stepped in and went into a room for meditation and didn't get out for a couple of days. So we were worried. We broke open the door of her baby that she might have died inside. She had not opened the door for two days. And we found that the sweet sitting on her foot was being eaten by the ants. And the ants had even eaten a part of the heel of the She was almost like dead. But she was in a state of meditation. We were very worried. We called great master again. And we said, Master, this baby is probably dying. And look, she's not even aware that her own heel is being eaten up by little insects, the ants. He said, Call Dr. Shakuntala <laughs> from Kapurthala. Send the car. Let her come. In post haste, the doctor comes. His great master says, Doctor, examine this baby. What is happening to her? She said, she is in deep coma because she is completely unaware of what's happening to the body. Body is being eaten up and she doesn't know. This is called deep coma. And she won't get out of it. You move her to the main hospital in Lahore immediately. Doctor said, I think she is going into Kanpermand into higher regions. Master, this is no time for jokes. This is no time for talking like this. This lady is in such deep trouble almost going to die, should be taken to hospital, and you are saying she is going into higher regions? This, this is a cruel joke. Master said, no, but I can ask the baby, she'll tell you. So how can you ask? She's in deep coma. Master said, when the coma is so deep, medical coma is so deep, and do the vital forces, the reactions disappear? Oh, they get lowered. Check her vital. Heart rate is all right, Master. Blood pressure is all right, Master. Temperature is all right, Master. What about the reflexes? So she took out a little hammer and she, oh, reflexes are normal also. She says, how can it be? Everything is normal. And the, and the cases of deep coma, do these two things go together? No, Master, I've never seen a case like this. The first case, it is more serious than I thought. Take her immediately to what? Master said, but I am going to ask her to tell us what she is seeing. Said, Master, you can't wake her up like this. She will need a lot of treatment. Maybe in coma for days, weeks. And Master said, Bibi, come out. And the Bibi opened her eyes. He said, what have you been seeing? Oh, Master, thank you. I was going into those higher regions. He described the whole description of the astral causal stages to everybody. And that's the first day. Then Dr. Shakuntala began to believe that there is some truth in the teaching of their master. So, <laughs> I am telling you the story to tell you how we are retaining the body. Higher experiences, if we want to have them permanently, we leave everything. They disappear. We are dying while living, which means the body is still functioning. The vital forces remain the same. Everything functions. We touch upon those centers of awareness which opens up the experiences of the higher regions. It does not mean that we really die and leave the body. It only means we have an ability, ability to have experiences of dying while living. We have experiences of going to the highest region, including such kind, while we are still having a physical body that is alive. So, just keep in mind, we don't die. We don't really die. People have done meditation and reached such kind and are still alive and kicking and they move around. Because that experience comes by taking the attention 
in the different points available in the physical body, which connect us with those experiences of the higher regions. So that's what we do. Of course, uh, when we go and never want to come back, then we never have another body, we never have another mind, we never have another astral body, we stay in our home unless we change our mind again. But how can we change our mind? We have no mind there. <laughs> but we have will. We have will, but no mind. <laughs>